Hey everybody, this is Bernie. Uh, John Patrick Grace was kind enough to have a conversation with me on this episode of Origin Stories on Creativity. He's a poet, editor, publisher. He owns a publishing house in Huntington, West Virginia called Publishing Place or Publisher's Place. Um, he also still runs a column for the Herald Dispatch. Um, does several workshops in town as well. Um, he's been around a while doing his thing. He has a, a lot of interesting opinions. So uh, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining me today. It, it, uh, it's, real, so, it's so cool to talk to you. So um, Okay, well, it's good to be able to do this. <laughs> What uh, so you used to be a uh, a co-host at a radio station? What what what, what did you co-host? Uh, it's, it's Kindred Communications in um, in Huntington. Um, I believe the the station was uh, one hundred four point nine, but I'm I may have that wrong. Um, they had, they're both F, FM and AM, and the company overall is called Kindred Communications. What what was the show, uh, programming about? Uh, this was a, a once a day talk show on political and social issues, uh, often local, sometimes on a state level, and sometimes we dealt with international issues or questions of health or even economics. Uh, and the, the uh, co-host was a former mayor of Huntington, Gene Dean, who was actually a, a Brit, London born. Oh, really? How did he end up being the, the mayor of Huntington? That's interesting. Uh, she, when she... Uh, left off being mayor, she was looking for things to do, and then her husband died, who was an architect, so she was really kind of rousting around for something to do, and she hit upon doing this radio show, and so she doesn't have that show anymore. They they, they made a change in format, but in um, any case, it, it, the show went on for a number of years. So you, you've lived a pretty interesting life. Uh, I know you started out, well, as far as I'm aware, you, you ended up in Chicago at some point. Is that where you're from? Well, I was born and raised in Chicago. Okay. I spent and, uh, five years studying for the priesthood and, and order of missionaries of the Sacred Heart. So that was out in the Fox River Valley, about 40 miles west of Chicago, Geneva, Illinois. I didn't stay in the seminary. I went to Loyola University in Chicago, majored initially in English, switched my major to history. Was it uh, had a literature year. or did you do uh, writing? Well, it was... The English major didn't last long enough for me to focus on something. I, I Before I could focus it that way, I switched to history. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. What about what about history appealed to you? Well, I actually, I wanted to be in journalism at that point, and I had, I, I had a part-time gig taking classified ads for the Chicago Tribune, so I went into the big major newspaper building every, well, not every day, but three days a week at part-time job while I was going to school and took classified ads. And I got down on the news floor at one point and um, an editor was very high up, uh, gave me a short interview about getting into journalism. And he said, uh, you should major in history, <laughs> <laughs> much better than English. So long story short, I switched my major to history. And anyway, I haven't regretted that. No, it's an interesting subject. I had debated myself. History ended up taking creative writing, and eh, maybe I regret it. Who knows? Uh, so in history, where did you um, dedicate yourself towards? Did you have a particular At, at that interest? point, uh, the, the undergraduate major at Loyola was general. There was no focus. Now that you have to major in a certain branch of history, even as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. At that time, we're talking the mid-1960s, you just did a history major, and made a selection of courses with an advisor. So I had a Latin American history course. I had several British history courses. I had a political science course in American diplomatic relations that counted for history. And I had American history courses and I had an economic history course. And so I got a smattering of courses, which I, I thought was pretty good instead of just, you know, you're gonna do only British history or something like that. Yeah, I mean, so, you're, gonna, you're gonna know history. You have to know it all. Um, so you, well, we never do. We never did Asia, and I, the whole, you know, Japanese Chinese history is a total blur. I mean, I I know nothing about it. So, have you done any studying on it since? No, not really. Although I've been to Hong Kong and I've been to Manila and the Philippines. Um, 
but no, no, I haven't. Um, my... yeah, fascinating culture, fascinating. Um, Korea, especially nowadays, uh, just looking back on you know the Korean War and what's happened to that entire region, it's just really interesting to play with. Yeah, those are hard languages to learn. I had an intern that went to Korea for a year and taught English there and made a really serious effort at learning Korean and, and, and got only to a very basic, basic level. And the Whereas language, I, the culture, the society, yeah. I mean, the way they treat each other, it's just a really complex situation. Right, right, right. We have printed a book in, in Korea. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, yeah we did it. A, a book over there. Uh, it was religion and basis, right? Pardon? Was it religious? No, it was actually a, a pictorial on cats. It's a book called, we <laughs> called Cat Book. Uh, amazingly, no other publisher had that title, so we have we have actually we have cat book and dog book <laughs> our publications. That's really interesting. Um, so let's go back to Lay Lola. They they spit you out in the middle of the sixties, correct? Yeah. You got I, a you I, got a degree in history, you're in Chicago. You're in the, the middle of one of the most turmoil tum, uh, tumultuous decades in American history. You're working in journalism. What do you do? Well, sort of, not quite. I mean, when I was an undergraduate, I was on the, on the newspaper. That's true. And then I was a uh, copy editor for the Loyola yearbook one year. Um, I wouldn't exactly call that journalism yet. And then I uh, got into the Columbia Journalism School for a master's degree. So that's, that's really getting into journalism. So my year of 64, 65 was at Columbia and the journalism school and that was that was a pretty turbulent period that's right lots of things were happening there were riots going on around the country and vietnam war protests and everything else do you have an affinity towards uh to chicago as a, as a hometown or when you left it you left it well actually i i got to a point in my life where i really preferred smaller cities i've lived i've you know i lived in big cities i uh, grew up in chicago uh, lived in New York twice uh, for a year each time, one year in school, one year working for the AP and Rockefeller Center. And I lived in Rome as a foreign correspondent. That's three million people. So when I came back to the United States, I just felt like I wanted to live in smaller places. I gravitated to Greensboro, North Carolina, which was then about 150,000 population. And ever since then, I've lived in, you know, medium to smaller cities where I'm living right now, Huntington, West Virginia, is a little under 50,000 people. Now, the interesting so, thing about Huntington, though, is one of those cities that's kind of been decimated by drugs and poverty. Uh, it has. I, there's a lot of irony here. We just won the Best Community in America Award. Really? Among communities of this size. I mean, the big cities were not in play. It was communities, you know, in the, in the range of maybe 50, 50 to 250,000. It's and very, the, best, it's a, the best community award was not based on, do you have all the best amenities, best education, cleanest air, blah, 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 lowest crime rate. It, it, it's ironically, was not based on anything like that. It was based on what are your problems and what are you doing about your problems? So it was the city that won, which we, Huntington did, was the city that had the best plan for coping with the urban problems we have. So well, that was what's, the the, what's Huntington's the plan? Well, I mean, obviously drugs, as you just mentioned, are very yeah. high. We have a very high uh, opioid addiction rate here. And consequently, there's a violent crime, too, that goes with the drug dealers. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I don't know all the details of the plan. And I'm a journalist here. I, I have a column in, in the paper, but mm -hmm. the I'm intending to find out. Um, but we want on the basis of uh, what are you going to do about your problems? I know a lot of it has to do with... Um, rehabilitating uh, questionable neighborhoods, marginal neighborhoods, and expanding broadband in, in the community and building in some uh, maybe opportunities for new industries to come in. I think it has a lot to do with things like that. Now, Amazon has a foothold there now and some other call center type businesses. It's a, Yeah, it's... well, I don't know if it's a call center, but um, there are several neighborhoods that they really want to rehab and um, and provide better op op educational and cultural opportunities for people in those neighborhoods, and then overall get broadband to everybody. And um, so those are some of the things they, they put in the plan, but whatever they put in there, we won. 
over all these well, other communities that we're trying winning to Winning is win something. I mean, do you think that Huntington's got a shot? Do you think small town America has a shot at winning going forward? Uh, yeah, because now with, with uh, technology, you can live anywhere and work for any company in the world, as you know. And so it doesn't yeah. matter to a lot of companies where you live. If you telecommute and things like that, or, or you're doing contract work, you can be anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I remember having a conversation with you um, uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whenever I worked at a publisher's place. You said West Virginia is one of the best places to be a writer because you could write here for very cheap. You could live here and basically make your living being a writer. Um, but you have to well, deal with... Well, there's a lot. There's a high percentage of uh, published writers per capita of the population in West Virginia. I can't give you the source, but I read that. I kind of believe it. We don't have many publishers in West Virginia. We're one of them. We have a, you know, we have a, a co-op, uh, not-for-profit regional publishing company here, but there aren't very many publishers in West Virginia. More writers, a lot more writers than publishers. And you're one of the publishers, though. I am one of the publishers, yeah. And do you stand by your statement, living in West Virginia is a great place to be a writer? Yeah, I would say it is. Um, uh, there's a lot to write about. Uh, a lot of controversial elements in the history of West Virginia, a lot of contradictions, which makes for good plotting if you're doing fiction, I guess. And um, yeah, I think the creative juices uh, flow pretty well here. Um, we've got a number of writing groups right in uh, Huntington. It's a small city, 50,000 people roughly, and we've got one of the better, um, I think, poetry groups in the country. It's a group that has a 35-year history, meeting once a month faithfully over the last 35 years. And some of the poets in the group, which are called the Guyandut Poets, because it was founded in an area of Huntington called Guyandut, um, have been published in the New Yorker and Harper's Magazine and the Atlantic Monthly and the Paris Review and have books of poetry out with good, good presses. Um, and this is just little old Huntington, you know, and they, they've been meeting faithfully once a month for 35 years, this group. Are you involved in that group? I am involved in that group. Um, I am sometime host of the meetings. They move from house to house and you host puts out refreshments and, um, and there's a whole ritual of how the meeting is run. You know, we usually have anywhere from, oh, five, six, eight, 10, 12 people come to a meeting at any given time and everyone brings poems. Mm -hmm. One poem, and you, you bring multiple copies, you pass your copies around, and when it comes your turn, you read your one poem while everyone's looking at your poem. And then there's how, a critique session that, that follows that for about six to eight minutes. How, long, how hard is it to get into a group like that? How hard is it to do what? To get into a group like that. With well, that I think much it's, pedigree. it's hard to get a group structured so that it will last 35 years, believe right? me. Right? Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know of a group that has lasted longer than, uh, I don't know, a few years, yeah. let alone 35. Well, it's, it's ritual. I mean, the hour, the, it's always the second, second Friday of the month. The meetings will always last approximately one and a half hours. Um, there's even a ritual as to how the poetry reading goes. It starts with the host and goes uh, counterclockwise from the host around the room. That's the ritual. And then we always break in the middle for more refreshments. And so there's a pause in the middle of the readings and we, you know, snack a little bit and come back with a glass of wine and continue the rest of the readings. Well, so the, my uh, question was like, in terms of new membership, do you guys take new poets in? Oh, yeah. Everybody's welcome, too. That's the whole thing. You can be oh, terrible and, and you'll still get into the group and people will be gentle with you. It's uh, it's quite now people that are fairly good in poetry have never been in the group before. Are often um, shocked by, you know, the critiques will be pretty sharp sometimes and, and mm -hmm. they won't come back. <laughs> people <laughs> thought they were pretty good poets and they couldn't take the criticism. And so they never came back. But, you know, if your poetry was weak and you knew it was weak, you wouldn't mind the criticism. And I've actually seen people over the years who were pretty weak in their poetry and but kept coming and got much better by virtue of coming for three or four years to that those meetings. 
That's fantastic. So how long have you been going? Has it been 35 years solid for you or what? what oh, is no, your... I've been here 22 years. So 22 I've been years. going most of the 22 years. I discovered the groups shortly after I got here. I'm not, I'm not an every time uh, participant. You know, I go maybe three times a year, four. And you always bring four a poem? Four or five in a good year, huh? You always bring a poem with you? Almost always. Almost how, always. Um, would you, um, do you write all the time? Are you all, I mean, I know no, you no, no, I don't write all the time. Um, I'm basically uh, editing or helping develop other people's writing as a publisher. So I do an awful lot of editing, yeah. deep editing, what we call developmental editing, and also the other levels of editing, which would be line editing and copy editing, and sometimes even proofreading, which is probably my least best skill. Um, mm -hmm. And With, I, uh, you know, I write a column every week for the paper, and so if I'm going to get a collection to the, of my columns together, huh? If I put your feet to the fire, what term would you associate with yourself? Writer, historian, Well, you know, the funny poet. thing you should ask that. I saw a question some years ago. If you had to say, would you rather be a writer or an editor, which would you say? And, and in my years in journalism long ago, when I was in daily journalism and everything, I would have said, hands down, a writer. Now I would say mm. an editor. Oh, interesting. Uh, because think, I've uh, got over 40 books out, 40, 40, 50 books that I have edited that are part of libraries and have been sold in bookstores, some of them across the country. Those books wouldn't exist probably if I hadn't contributed the editing I, I did to the books. Uh, they wouldn't have made it. So no, couldn't you couldn't you say the same thing with publishing too? Could you call yourself a publisher? Isn't the number substantially more in terms of how many books you put out into the world? For I've edited reading? I've edited more books, many more books than I've published. But oh, interesting. Okay. I just I like the process of publishing. I like the idea of helping people uh, get books really market ready so that they can be competitive in the bookstores and things like that. Um, we work hard at that. Um, as a small publisher, we haven't put the time and energy and creativity into sales and marketing that we really would like to have because we're always working on the next book, and that's the problem. And so our books, maybe maybe we do a book that sells 1,500 copies, you know, but if that same book, you know, without changing a comma, were published by a major publisher, they would find a way to make that book sell 15,000 copies, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, they wouldn't so that's kind of the anguish there of small publishing. Um, how do you um how do you feel about publishing nowadays with the whole advent of indies where me as a writer could publish on Amazon without having to touch a publisher? Uh, Amazon is you know widely considered the number one enemy in publishing by people in publishing companies, but no doubt. Uh, uh, that there's a whole story you there. You probably are, I'd yeah, and now Amazon I mean, is going to do their own brick and mortar bookstores. You know, no, I hadn't heard that. Irony of ironies. I mean, they were, Amazon has been responsible for the decline of book and mortar bookstores. Now they're going to do some. What are they going to sell? <laughs> are they going to sell the same books that they're putting out of business or are they going to sell my uh, I book? don't know. Well, actually, <laughs> the e-book e readers are going down in, in sales. Um, that plateaued a number of years ago. It never even reached 30% of, of sales of books. Um, it's descending a little bit, and I don't think it's going to go back up. So hardcovers have actually been making a, a comeback in, in the bookstore market. In, independent bookstores are up slightly over last year. Actually, there's an increase in independent bookstores over uh, 20, 2015 or so. That's so, interesting. Do you think that's a generational thing? Because, I mean, in terms of myself, I only read on my phone. I only read on a tablet. I haven't bought a book, in, and I'm a voracious reader. I've got 50 books yeah. on my phone right now. Um, I have not question. bought a book in decades. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a threat anymore. Actually, we do ebooks on most of our titles. Uh, we produce printed and bound books and then ebooks, and our ebooks are sell only less than ten percent of what we sell in printed and bound. That may be a function of being a regional publisher. Might be because I think people that want to read about something close to home and you know it, they buy the book because it's they're West Virginia and the book is about West Virginia they just want the book <laughs> put the book no, on the shelf or something you know I think that might be the case too because the smaller the publisher the less likely they're going to be able to find it in like a pirating well yeah 
Well, we do ebooks. They're not expensive to do. It's a reconversion of formatting, and you pay a graphic artist to redo the book for the ebook format. And we only do Amazon ebooks. We don't do them for Barnes and Noble or some of the other smaller ebook uh, outlets. But we do no, Amazon find, ebooks. I find the argument very interesting because it does. There is an artistry to it that is up going away. Um, if you, I could do an ebook. I have done an ebook. It looks good. It looks fine. I could do a cover by myself in my basement. There's nothing really to it. But if I want to do a bound book, I would have to get a team of uh, people together to put that together. That I couldn't right. do myself. Yeah, I don't do them myself. I'm not technologically up on that. But we we hire somebody to do ebooks for us, and they do a good job. Um, to get back to the subject of uh, of writing groups themselves, the poetry group is not the only one that you do, though. I don't think. Uh, no, we have other groups in Huntington. We have, uh, amazingly, we have other writing groups. I teach a life writing class. That's what I thought. And that um, class has a 16-year history. We had over 400 people through that class. You're still doing that. One books have been published by people that have gone through the life writing class. That, that's, that's amazing to me, is that you're not just publishing books. You're not just editing books. You're actually helping people produce the books, too, and the poetry. Yeah, and, and by and large, these are people that have never written a book before. They may have written magazine articles or newspaper articles or newsletter pieces, or, but they've never written a book. Um, some of them come in as pretty good writers, some of them mediocre writers, some of them kind of weak writers, but I think everybody improves a bit, and even some of the weak writers have gotten to the point where, with good editing, you know, they can they can get out a book. So, so let, let's go back to the beginning, um, because I'm I'm curious as far as who you know Patrick Grace is. He's a writer. He's an editor. He's a publisher. He's somebody who has a, a hunger to help people tell stories. Why did you go into the seminary? Why did you want to be a priest? Why did I want to be a priest? Well, I grew up Catholic. I grew up uh, as an altar boy as well. I was an altar boy at my grade school. As an altar boy, you're very close to the mass. You have a, you know, you're right there when the priest is holding up the host for consecration and everything. You're right underneath all of that. It's very close to you. You're right there where the priest is speaking out the words of the mass to the congregation. So something, a spark kind of, transfers to a lot of altar boys, I think they at least think of themselves possibly as becoming a priest. So I, I'm sure that had something to do with it. Do you think that had anything to do with your desire to, to write? To do what? To, to write, to, to yeah, see Yeah, I did more. want to write as, I did want to write as a priest, as a matter of fact, that, that order I went through the seminary with had a magazine and I saw myself as, as contributing, you know, articles to their magazine after I got you know, became a priest, uh, but um, so curiously now I, I probably can do that because now I'm back into the family as it were. I've, I've joined their lay associates. So I'm a lay missionary oh, of the Sacred Heart. Oh, really? Yeah, we have, have a chapter of that here in Huntington now. So um, then English did not pan out, which is fascinating to me that you wouldn't have stuck with uh, literature as your pursuit. Well, it didn't pan out it, because I... It wasn't that I didn't want to continue with English. It was, I didn't really want to do a double major. I mean, college is hard enough without double majoring in English and history. Um, um, I've got a daughter. Uh, I've got a, um, not daughter, a, um, a granddaughter right now who is double majoring in um, Russian and international relations. Of course, they kind of go together Ooh. at the University of Georgia. <laughs> yeah. But that's a heavy load, you know. I mean, yeah, Russian, my goodness, two, it's a... It's an impressive language. Complete two full-blown majors like that and, and, and do well in both majors. That, that's, that's, I wasn't up for that. So I, I left English to do the major in history, but not without any uh, disrespect for English. Or I enjoyed English. I had a great Shakespeare course in, in, uh, at Loyola before I left off being an English major. Well, Loyola is a, a great university. Well, it's a great university. It's a good university. I, I don't know. It's probably great in certain fields like a lot of universities, but even Marshall University right here in Huntington is great in certain things. It's a small university, but for a while here, we had the number one forensic sciences program in the country. You know, all the CSI stuff. You know, mm -hmm. They do that right here at Marshall. I took some graduate classes in communications. Yeah, and the radio, the college radio station here at Marshall University 
has won tons of awards uh, as best best in this, best in that, nationally and regionally. They've got all kinds of trophies and plaques and awards that they've won. It's an so impressive it, college, and it's small too. It's like what, uh, like three thousand kids or something like that. It's not gigantic, and it's so good for Huntington too. Yeah. Well, did you so did you mention Huntington. DePaul? DePaul, no. What's DePaul? Oh, DePaul is another Catholic university in Chicago. I thought. No. What? 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 What's uh, the significance? Oh, I thought. I just thought you mentioned it. You mentioned something that sounded like DePaul. What was that? You just asked me a question or made a comment about. Uh, it must have slipped my mind completely. But you know what was on my mind? How long did you spend in Chicago after you graduated college? Well, I, I have spent altogether in my life probably about mm, 16 years in Chicago. I, I grew up there until eighth grade. Then I five years in the seminary away from Chicago and then altogether uh, two years of college in Chicago and then one year of junior year abroad in Rome. Royal ah, Center. Rome is beautiful. You didn't like Rome. I do. I, I do like Rome. I, I spent six years in Rome. I was, I was I loved Rome. correspondent I for the AP in Rome. Covered the Vatican for the AP for a while in Rome. As an old so, yeah. newspaper man, how do you feel about the uh, the current state of mass media the current state of mass media yeah the sensationalism you brought a question mass media is it here that takes in that takes in movies and well <laughs> uh, i guess and... I, I guess i guess in terms of uh relaying <laughs> news in terms how do of i giving... feel about the current state of journalism maybe or something like maybe that? yeah journalism let's go with that uh well the current state of um Journalism is also a very broad question because you've got national journalism and you've got national media, and then you've got, uh, you know, places like Huntington that have a newspaper and radio and television stations. That's a whole different level of Let's bring in a small sometimes. But How do you feel about uh, the Herald Dispatch? Do you think they're doing the a Herald good Dispatch job? The Herald Dispatch is a, a newspaper that is, I think, adequate in many regards. There's zero investigative reporting, but Investigative reporting, as you probably are aware, is a very expensive undertaking. Mm -hmm. There are legal liabilities with investigative reporting, and sometimes you have to turn loose, turn loose the reporter for three weeks on a story and, and end up not doing anything, saying no story, because we, we don't have a firm enough grip on the scandal or something to publish something in the paper. We don't want to get sued. Uh, so there's, there's zero investigative reporting. Uh, they tend to play local news, I think, too big over national and international news. But it's a relatively clean paper in terms of not a lot of typographical errors, currently at least, there used to be. And the, the writing of the local reporters is pretty good. So that, that's what I would say. And the sports section is good. They do a good job on sports. And they can basically give their news away for free too with the internet, right? Nobody's actually paying for it anymore. That was a Nobody's big mistake. A... That was a big mistake that almost every newspaper in the country made, giving their their, their content away free on the internet. They don't you know why they did that? Choice, they though. they they naively expected advertising to migrate online and replace uh, print advertising. That's what everybody and thinks, though, isn't it? That's Doesn't simply everybody think that advertisement's going to be the the wave of the future. It's going to fill people's wallets. Uh, I don't know, but they that was that was the that was the bet that. The big ads they were putting in the, in the print newspaper would somehow migrate online and they would recover all that revenue because that people would be advertising like crazy online. And that never happened. Well, how do you get the revenue then if it's not advertising and if it's not clicks? Well, they went back to relying on print advertising, obviously. So those who's, who's newspapers, newspapers needed to keep their print editions because they wouldn't have had enough advertising to, to continue if, if they hadn't bolstered their print editions. Actually, the print edition of the Huntington paper has been growing slightly rather than declining. Slightly. It's kind of slight growth trajectory. Um, slightly. So, but you know, those big car dealerships and things like that that had the dub double truck ads and in the papers and, you know, where their cars were splashed on pages real big and everything. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to just rely on, on, on internet advertising. They, they wanted people to, to look at all their stuff and two page display and things like that. So, 
that kind of advertising was just not going to come to online editions of the newspaper in the same dollar volume. That's interesting, but still, who's buying the newspaper and looking at that advertisement? Well, as I say, the Huntington paper is on a slight growth trajectory. The circulation is increasing. I think it's, it's an interesting conversation topic because it does kind of bring into light the whole internet and the writing aspects of my life and your life, for that matter. Who's getting the clicks? Who's paying for yeah. the clicks? Who's paying well, the money? Where's the money coming in at? Who's filling the wallets? Yeah, for some reason or other, you know, you can, you can, you can, uh, there's a great French verb, rentabiliser, which means to make up for in, in, in other, in other ways, in other words, pay for, you can pay for your whole year subscription to a newspaper just with the coupons you get. Uh, in fact, you, if you used even a tenth of the coupons, you'd probably double the price of what you pay for the newspaper. I don't know, my wife, she does uh, um, couponing on the internet. Yeah, you can coupon on the internet. If you get coupons on the internet, that's fine too. But but the coupons sort of fall out of the paper at you, so you see them in a way that maybe you wouldn't see them on the internet. Well, I mean, let's let's take. You get the newspaper on the internet, right? The Herald Dispatch. I look it's, at. I I get the well, news. Well, not anymore. No, they like a lot of newspapers. They got savvy, and you can't have it all free anymore. Uh, and that's true for the New York Times, Washington Post, other papers. They all they all cut that off. You, what you can get free from any given newspaper anymore is probably some of the headline stuff and uh, a few of the main stories, maybe a column or two. But to get the whole paper, you have to be a print subscriber. And, and that's, what if that's people assume case. that's the whole paper? They just stop that's caring the about that's, the rest of it. Yeah, that's the case with the Herald Dispatch. You have to be a a full print subscriber to get the full online edition. Is it helping? Oh uh, yeah, it obviously did it. I think it staunched the bleeding of, 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 of print editions going down. They were sinking rapidly, but they had made that mistake of putting all their content on the web free. And uh, they, it took them a number of years before they figured out that they couldn't do that anymore. And they had to charge for it. Another interesting thing that you said was that the uh, the typos improved. Do you think that's because the talent increased? Oh, I just think the change of editors and um, they got the they big guys. They became aware that it, it, a lot of readers were complaining about typos and they cracked down on it. Uh, yeah, you know, I would if I were running that paper, that would be one thing I would really really <laughs> bear down on hard. Is you don't want you don't want grammatical mistakes in the paper. You don't want misspelled words you don't want missing words is even the worst of all the word is, is that a uh, is that a dream job would that have been something that you would have loved to have done no no what running what's a, a dream paper, job for you no, probably not i might have wanted to run an editorial page and, and choose all the columns and the syndicated columnists and everything else what is um what does tomorrow have for you what are you doing oh, with the rest just of those? Do it. well i'd like to i'd like to focus a little more on, on my own writing actually I've got books that I'd like to get back out and in print um, and books like my columns I'd like to do a collection of my columns into a book interesting I've got so you're going to take editing you're going to edit yourself you're going to take the art of editing uh, I might edit. hire an editor as well oh. I think even editors that write books should probably get their another editor to look at their book um, you don't have to take all their suggestions, but it's really good to get somebody else to look at your work. Yeah, unfortunately. And Actually, this, this could be a problem. This could be a problem with major writers. There are major writers, the big big sellers, big selling writers. You can't edit them anymore. They, they won't let themselves be edited. They just say this is the way it is. You know. <laughs> I don't know how anybody. I don't, could take I don't that. want any talk. My my stuff goes into the book just the way I send it to you. <laughs> no, I could never imagine that being the case with anybody. <laughs> oh, there are writers like that. Oh, there are writers. Oh, the like ego. That. I could imagine. I'm my first drafts are horrible. My second drafts, my third drafts. Well, know. it gets better. I mean, doing a column, I will say over the years, I don't have to do like as many drafts of a column as I, I might have earlier when I was starting writing columns. I know more clearly what I want to say, and when I get it down on paper. I can tweak it and fix it up here and there and maybe find something to insert. But I rarely 
totally redo the lead paragraph or restructure the whole thing, you know, or throw something away and start over again. I don't do that. I, I maybe see maybe that. it's true for the shorter stuff, but when I'm writing a novel, I feel so lost in it. I'm, it's unfortunate. What kind of novels are you writing? Uh, right now I'm writing a science fiction piece. Um, the one I just finished that's published on Amazon is noir. Well, do you outline your novels? No, unfortunately, I'm a gardener. I kind of just uh, constantly go back in and see what I have. So, um, well, there are two ways, two ways of writing a novel. One is outlining the novel to start with. You can always change the outline. Yeah, the other I way is that, just diving though. in and figure, figuring in. it out as you go along. But um, that's me. You might, you might try outlining a novel and, and following an outline. It's, uh, it's basically outlined. If I start with, uh, I have an ending. I know where I'm going. And the yeah, end- this mystery novelists often write the last chapter first. I understand. Yeah, I had the last. And then scene. they work, work toward that. Well, try outlining a novel. Um, as I say, an outline can be malleable. You can always change the outline. That's true. Uh, but you might find um, that it would be a help. At least it's worth experimenting with, and you might find that it, it keeps you on track better. I think there's a novel. I think the title is The Exhibitionist, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. and it was written by a former uh, a, a, an AP journalist that worked in Rome, like I did, but many years later, and then worked maybe in London for a while, and did a novel. I think it's called The Exhibitionist, about the Rome Daily American, which was a daily newspaper published in Rome. And each chapter focuses on a different character in the newsroom, either the publisher or the main editor or the managing editor or, you know, the society reporter or whatever else. So you kind of get these little vignette, almost short story chapters within a novel. But once Mm -hmm. you get enough characters introduced, then he brings in other characters you've read about before as part of, you know, a subsequent chapter of focusing on some other character. It's very yeah. cleverly done. I've got the title right, The Exhibitionist, but I'm not entirely sure, and I can't remember the author's name. I'll look it up. I'll put it in the show notes, too, in case anybody else is interested. But if you like writing short stories, you could come up with a way of writing a novel that was basically a necklace of, you know, 15, 16 different short stories. Okay, Patrick. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today. And that was John Patrick Grace. Uh, Next up is Sasha Black. She is an indie publisher. She just put out her 13 Steps to Evil. Uh, She's also a very successful blogger, um, has a great personality. I really enjoyed our conversation. She's number 17 on origin, stories on creativity. Uh, Follow me on Twitter, Brian Yellow. Uh, BrianEO.com is up and running again, and uh, thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.